The Cube presents Ignite 22. Brought to you by Palo Alto Networks. Welcome back to Vegas, guys and girls. It's great to have you with us. The Cube live, finishing our second day of coverage of Palo Alto Ignite 22 from MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Lisa Martin here with Dave Vellante. Dave, cybersecurity is one of my favorite topics to talk about because it is so interesting, it is so dynamic. My other favorite thing is to hear the voice of our vendors' customers, and we could to do that. Next. I always love to have the customer on. You get, you get right to the heart of the matter. Yeah. Really understand. You know what I like to do is to, when I listen to the keynotes, try to see how well it aligns with what the customers are actually doing. Yeah. So, let's do it. We're going to unpack that now. Michael Fagan joins us, the Chief Transformation Officer at Village Roadshow. Welcome, Michael, it's great to have you. Well, thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. So, this is a really interesting mm. entertainment company. I find the name interesting. Yeah. But talk to us a little bit about Village Roadshow so the audience gets an understanding yeah. of all of the things that you guys do, because theme parks is part of this. Yeah, so Village Roadshow is Australia's largest cinema exhibitor in conjunction with our partners at Event. We also own and operate Australia's largest uh, theme parks. We have Warner Brothers Movie World, Wet n Wild, Sea World, uh, Top Golf in Australia is, is operated by us, plus more. Uh, we also do studio. Uh, we also own. Uh, Movie studios, so Aquaman, Pirates of the Caribbean, we're, we're filming our movie studios, Elvis, last year. Uh, and we also uh, distribute uh, and produce uh, movies and TV shows. So cool. quite a diverse uh, group. Yeah, you guys have won diverse. a lot of awards. I mean, I don't know, Academy Awards, Golden yeah. Globes, all that stuff. Yeah. You yeah. know, and uh, so it's good, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Cool stuff. I want to also, before we dig into the use case here, talk to us about the role of a Chief Transformation Officer. How long have you been in that role? What does it encompass and what do you get to drive from a transformation perspective? Yeah, so the, the, the nature and pace of disruption uh, is accelerating and on, on one side and then on the other side, the uh, running business as usual is becoming increasingly complex and, and more difficult to do. So uh, running both simultaneously and at pace can put organizations at risk both financially and, uh, and in other ways. So in my role as Chief Transformation Officer, I support the rest of the executive team by giving them additional capacity and also bring capability to the team that uh, wasn't there before. So I do a lot of uh, strategic and thought leadership, there's some executive coaching in there, a lot of financial modeling and analysis, uh, and I believe that when a transformation role, and particularly a chief transformation role is done correctly, it's a very hands-on role. So there's certain things where I, I dive right down and I'm actually hands-on hands leading teams or leading pieces of work, so I might be leading particular projects. I try to drive uh, profit, revenue and profitability across the divisions, and if there's any multi or cross-divisional opportunities or initiatives, then I will, I will lead those. The transformation, you know, a while ago was cloud, right? Okay, hey, cloud. And <coughs> the transformation officers, whether or not they had that title, would mm. tell you, look, you got to change the operating model. You mm. can't just, you know, lift and shift in the cloud. That's, you know, that's pennies. We want, you know, big bucks. So that's yeah. the operating. Now, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm, my question is, is, did the pandemic just accelerate your transformation or, or was it, you know, deeper than that? Yeah, so within my role I have both digital and business transformation, some of it has been organizational. Uh, I think the pandemic has had a, a significant and long lasting effect on society, not just on, on business. So uh, I think if you think about how work, work used to be a, a place you went to and how it was done beforehand, uh, before, the, before COVID uh, versus now where uh, you know, previously you know, within the enterprise, you had all of the users, you had all of the applications, you had all of the data, you had all of the people. And then since March 2020, just overnight, that kind of inverted. And, you know, you had people working from home and a person working from home is a branch office of one. Right. So, so we ended up with another thousand branches, literally overnight. Uh, a lot of the applications that we use are now SaaS or cloud-based, whether that's timekeeping with Kronos or, Communicate, uh, employee communications with work jam, so they're not sitting within our data center, they're not sitting within, within our enterprise, it's all external. So from a security perspective, mm. you obviously had to respond to that. Mm. We heard a lot about endpoint, and mm. cloud security, and refactoring the network, and uh, identity, these guys aren't really an identity, they partner for that, but still, a lot of change in focus that the CISO had to deal with. How, how did you guys respond to that? And and you had a rush to do it, 
Yeah. And so as you sit back now, where do you go from here? Well, we had, we had two uh, major triggers for our, our network and security transformation. Uh, the first being uh, COVID itself, and then the second being we had a, a major MPLS telco renewal that came up. So that gave us an opportunity to look at what we were doing. And essentially our network was designed for an era that no longer exists, for when, uh, for when, like I said, when, peop when people uh, were from home, all the applications were inside. So, and we had aging infrastructure, our firewalls were end of life. So initially we started off with an SD-WAN, uh, at the SD-WAN layer and an SD-WAN implementation. But when we investigated and saw the security uh, capabilities that are available now, uh, we expanded that to a full SASE SD-WAN implementation. Why Palo Alto Networks? Because you, you, <coughs> you said you had an aging infrastructure designed for an era that doesn't exist yeah. anymore, but you also had a number of tools. We've been talking about a consolidation a lot in the last couple of yeah. days. How did, what did you consolidate and why with Palo Alto? Uh, so we had a great partner in Australia, incidentally also called Cube, Cube Networks. Yeah. Uh, that what we a great name. With, so. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, so we, we worked for Cube, we ran a, a formal tender process, and Palo Alto with you know, Prisma Access and Global, um, uh, Global Protect was the only, uh, the only solution that gave us everything that we needed in terms of network modernization, uh, the agility that we required. So for example, in our theme park, we want to send out a hot dog car or an ice cream cart and that becomes all of a sudden you've got a new branch that I want to spin up this branch in 10 minutes and then I want to spin it back down again. So from agility perspective, from a flexibility perspective, the security that, uh, that we wanted you know, from a zero trust um, uh, perspective and they were the only, uh, certainly from a zero trust perspective, they're probably the only vendor that, that exists that, um, that actually provide the, the, all those capabilities. And did you consolidate tools or are you in the process of consolidating tools now? Yeah, so we actually, we actually consolidated down to, um, to, to, a, to a single vendor and in my previous role I had, I had implemented at SD-WAN um, before, and uh, you know, interoperability is a, is a major issue in the IT industry. I think there's, it's probably the only industry in the, the only industry I can think of certainly that where we, we ship products that aren't ready. They're not full, they don't have all the features they, they don't have all the features that they should have, there are plans, they were releasing patches, releasing additional features every, every couple of months, so uh, you know, if you, if Ford sold the car, they said, hey, we're going to give you back seats in a couple of months, and there'd be uproar. But, but we do that all the time in, uh, in, you know, in IT. So uh, I had, when I previously implemented uh, an SD-WAN transformation, I had products from two tier one vendors that just didn't talk to one another. And so when I went and spoke to those vendors, they just went, well, it's not me, it's clearly, clearly those guys. So, so there's a lot to be said for having a, you know, a champion team rather than a team of champions. And Palo Alto have got that full stack, fully integrated, that was, you know, exactly met what we were looking for. They've been talking a lot the last couple of days uh, about integration, and, it, and I've talked with some of their executives and some analysts as well, including Dave, about that seems to be a differentiator mm. for them because they really focus on that. Their M&A mm. strategy is very, um, it seems to be very clear, yeah. and there's purpose on that back-end integration instead of leaving it mm. to the customer like Village Roadshow to do it. Mm. They also talked a lot about the consolidation. Mm. I'm just curious, Michael, in terms of like what you've heard at the show in the last couple mm. of days, yeah, I mean, I've been hearing the same message, but actually we've, li we've lived it. You're at living it, that's what yeah. I wanted to know. So, so, you know, we had a choice of, you know, do you try and purchase so-called best of breed products and then put a lot of effort into integrating them and trying to get them to work, which is not really what we want to spend time doing. I don't, I don't want to be famous for, you know, integration and you know, great infrastructure. I want, to be, I want Village to be famous for delivering great experiences to our customers, memories that last a lifetime. And you know, when kids grow up in Australia, they, everybody remembers going to the theme parks. That's what, that's what I want our team to be doing and to be delivering those great experiences, not to be trying to plug together bits of software that may or may not work and have vendors pointing at one another, and then we're left uh, carrying the can and holding the baby. So what was the before and after? Can you give us a sense as to how life changed you know, pre that consolidation uh, versus post? Yeah, so our, our, uh, our infrastructure, like I said, our infrastructure was designed for you know, the you know, old ways of working where uh, we had you know, routers, and far, routers that were you know, not designed for, cloud, for modern traffic, including cloud destined traffic, uh, an old MPLS network. We used to backhaul all the traffic from, uh, from our branches back to a central location where we've got uh, you know, firewalls, we've got a DMZ, we can run advanced inspection services on that. So if you had um, a branch that wanted to access
access a website that was housed next door, even if it was across the country, then it would, we would pull that all the way back to Melbourne, we would apply advanced inspection services to it, send it up to the cloud, out back across the country, traffic would come back, go down to us, back out to our branch. So you talk about crossing the country four times, even if the website is, is situated next door. Now with, uh, uh, with our SASE SD-WAN transformation, it just pops out to the cloud now, straight away, and the, the difference in uh, performance for our, uh, for our team and for our customers is, is phenomenal. So you talk about saving minutes you know, on a log on and, and seconds then on, a, on an average transaction. And seconds don't sound like a lot, but when you, it's every click, you know, saving a second and you add it up, you're talking about thousands of man hours every month that we've saved. If near Zook were sitting right here mm -hmm. and said, what could we do better? You know, what do you need from us that we're not delivering today that you want, to, you want us to deliver that would change your life? Yeah. Um, there's two things, one, one of which I think they're, all, they're already doing but I actually haven't experienced myself. It's around uh, the autonomous uh, digital experience management. So uh, I've now got a thousand users who are sitting at home and they've got, when they've got a problem, I don't know, is it, is it my problem or is it their problem? Um, so I know that uh, Palo were working on a, a, a uh, Adam solution, that digital experience uh, solution, which can actually tell, well, I, actually, you know, you're sitting in your kitchen and your router's in your front room, maybe you should move closer to the router. <laughs> so they're, they're the, that's one thing. And the second thing is uh, using uh, AI to tell me things that I wouldn't be able to figure out with a human spending a lot of time sifting through data. So things like where I've potentially overcompensated and you know, over-delivered on the network and security side or I've potentially under-delivered on a security side. So having uh, AI to you know, assess all of those millions and probably billions of you know, transactions and packets that are moving around our network and say, hey, you could optimize it more if you, if you dial this down or dial this up. So you said earlier, we, this industry has a habit of shipping products mm. before you know, they're ready. So based on your experience, it mm. seems like, first of all, it sounds like you got a, at least a decent technical background as well. When do you expect to have that capability, realistically? Mm. When can we expect that as an industry? Mm. Uh, I, think, I, th I think, like I said, the, the rate and nature of change is, is I think it's accelerating. Now, the half-life of a degree is short. I think when I left university, what I, what I learned in first year was, was you know, obsolete within five years. I say now it's probably obsolete. If you, what you learn in first year is probably obsolete by the time you finish your Six degree. Six months, that's yeah. true. So I think uh, the, the, the rate of change and the, the partnership that I see Palo building with the likes of AWS and Google uh, and, that, and how they're coming together to, to, solve, to jointly solve these problems. And I think we will see this within 12 months. Who, who are your clouds? You got multiple clouds? Or? Uh, we got uh, multiple clouds, mostly AWS, but there are certain things that we run that run in, uh, run in Azure as well. We, we don't really have much in GCP or, or, or some of the other. Azure for collaboration and uh, teams, hmm. stuff like that? Uh, we, we, run, we run SAP, that's uh, oh, currently okay. hosted in, in Azure, and our cinema ticketing system is, is, was run in Azure. It's, it was only available in, in, in Azure at the time. We, were mo we are mostly an AWS shop. And what do you do with AWS? I mean, pretty much everything else is... Yeah. Pretty much every, everything else, anything that's customer facing, our websites, uh, they give us great stability, great, great availability, uh, great performance. Um, you know, we've had, and, 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 and a very variable as well, so we'll, you know, our, our pattern of selling movie tickets is typically, you know, fairly flat, except when, you know, there's a launch of a, of a new movie. So and all of a sudden, we might say, you might sell, you know, at 9 a.m. when, you know, Spider-Man went on sale last year, I think we sold 100 times the amount of tickets in the first 10 minutes. So you know, our website didn't just scale up beautifully, just took in all of that extra traffic, scale up without any intervention, and then scale back down. Taylor Swift needs that. Um, she and, does and need so, that. Yeah, and so <laughs> is your vision to have the Palo Alto Network's security infrastructure mm -hmm. have, be a common sort of layer across mm -hmm. those clouds and maybe even some on-prem? Is it, are, yes. you, are you working yes. toward that? Yeah, uh, we, yeah, we, yeah we'd, we'd love to have, um, you know, our, our, end, our end customers don't really care about the infrastructure that, that, sure. that we run. Right. A, they want unless to be it, able to. Unless it breaks. Unless it breaks, yeah. They, they want to be able to go to see a movie, they want to be able to get on a roller coaster, they want to be able to go, you know, play around a, around a top golf. Uh, so having that convergence and that seamless integration and working across cloud, network, security. Now for most of our team, they, they don't know, and they don't need to know. In fact, I frankly don't want them to know and be, be thinking about networks and clouds. I kind of want them thinking about how do we sell more cinema tickets, how do we give a great experience to our guests, how do we give long-lasting uh, lifetime memories to, uh, to the people who come visit our parks. 
That's what they want. They want that experience, right? I'd love to get your final thoughts on, we, we had you give a great uh, mm. overview of the, the role that you play as Chief mm. Transformation Officer. You own digital transformation, you own business transformation. What advice would you give to either other mm. uh, tra Chief Transformation Officers, CISOs, CSOs, COOs mm. about partnering with the right partner to really improve your security posture? Mm. Um, I think there's, there's two things. One is, if you haven't looked at this in the last two years and made some changes, you're out of date yeah. because the world has changed. We've seen, um, I mean, I've heard somebody say it was two decades worth of change. I actually think it's probably five, 50 years worth of change in, in Australia in terms of working habits. So, uh, one, you need to do something. Yeah, you, need to, you need to have a look at this. Uh, the second thing, um, uh, I think is to uh, try and partner with someone that has similar values to your organization. So Village is a, it's a wonderful, innovative company, uh, very agile. So the, like the, the concept of gold class cinema, so you know, big plush seats, recliners, waiter service, elevated foods concept, that, that was invented by Village in 1997. Thank you. And yeah, we had, finally came to the States so a decade well, later. We, I mean, <laughs> we would have had the CEO of every major cinema chain in the world come to, come to Melbourne and have a look at what Village just doing and go, yeah, we're going to export that back <laughs> yeah. around, around the world. It's probably one of, one of Australia's unknown exports. Yeah, um, yeah, so, it's, yeah so, so partnering, with, so we've got a great innovation history and our pre, we'd like to think of ourselves as pretty agile. So working with partners who are, have a similar thought process and, and manage to an outcome and not to a contract yeah. is, uh, is important for us. It's all about outcomes and you've had some great outcomes. Michael, thank you for joining us on the program, walking us through Village Roadshow, the challenges that you had, how you tackled them, and, and next time I think I'm in a movie theater and I'm in a reclining chair, I'm going to think about you and Village. So thank you. Hello. We thank appreciate you, your insights and thank your you. time. Thanks, Michael. For Michael Fagan and Dave Vellante, I'm Lisa Martin. You've been watching theCUBE. Our live coverage of Palo Alto Network's Ignite comes to an end. We thank you so much for watching. We appreciate you. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live enterprise and emerging tech coverage. Next year. Yeah.